for coming. So we are coming to the end of the Human Advantage for 2024. We have one session left. Looking back over today, much of what we've been talking about is about getting better through AI. Not necessarily changing everything, not you know ripping up the map and starting again, but finding ways to be more efficient, get to better outcomes, better at leading, better at uncovering insights. So this is all in an effort to improve ourselves, our business, our teams. To wrap up this year, our closing keynote is on how to stay smart in a very smart world with Gerd Gigerinzer. I'm going to pass it over to Eric and Emily who have conducted this interview. So we'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Now it is time for our closing keynote, and I am delighted to introduce our speaker, Professor Gert Gigerenzer. That I will have the honor to interview is my colleague, Emily Boots, that you know very well now, our Chief Innovation Officer at the BVA family. Professor Gigerenzer is a giant in the world of academic research on human behavior and decision making. The longtime director at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, Professor Gigerinzer is director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the University of Potsdam, a partner at Simply Rational, the Institute for Decision, and vice president of the European Research Council. He is also the former professor of psychology at the University of Chicago. Professor Gigerinzer is the author of multiple books. I have some years here, translated in more than 20 languages, including How to Stay Smart in a Smart World, published in 2021, I think, which will be at the center of our conversation today. Welcome, Professor Gigerinzer. We are honored and very excited to have you at the Human Advantage Conference and to have the opportunity to talk with you about how to make better decisions in a digital world. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Here I am. Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here and having this conversation with you, Professor. So today we are at the second and final day of the Human Advantage Conference. Um, the exploration around AI across many different topics in many different sectors uh, was absolutely impressive. Today, we want to conclude, and today we want to conclude around a very fundamental um, subject, which is very central to your book, How to Stay Smart in a Small World. So we're going to be talking about the limits and the risk of this new world, this new reality, and what must be done to remain in control of our lives. You put it very well in the final sentence of your book, how do we make the digital world a world in which we want to live? The idea is to have this conversation in three different parts. I'm trying to anchor you in the way we're going to be discussing this topic because it's a very big topic. So we will be discussing first the limitations around AI and what it can do and cannot do because we will see that experience that it cannot work all the time. Second, we will be looking at the risk that the current development of AI poses. And third, finally, we'll, uh, we'll conclude around the solutions that you offer and you propose. So before we start and we delve into those three topics, I would like to ask you for your general perspective around that challenge that the world faces with the emergence of AI. Yeah. Um, it's not the AI that is a problem. It is the people behind the AI. So it's not a super intelligence that soon will have humans like dogs on its leash. But it is the old problem who owns technology and how it's being used that's often hidden behind the discussions about whether AI is a big benefit or it's a big horror and so on. That's the wrong question. So uh, we need to think more about uh, what is the use, how do we put AI to use? 
So before 2000, uh, most of us, including me, were absolutely enthusiastic about the potential of AI. And I remember medical doctors who thought, finally, uh, the information will be broadcast to everyone in the world without interference of industry or politics. And the dream of Immanuel Kant about an enlightened world would come true. And it was not at all thought to be a pro-profit enterprise. Even the young founders of Google wrote in 1998 an article where they pointed out that a search machine should be a scientific tool and warned against its misuse as an advertising money-making machine. But it took about three years, and then they totally turned around. So that shows that we need to find a way to turn the wheels back and to uh, change the world in which we are, where we are surveilled, where our data is used to build models of ourselves to predict and manipulate us into a world, to a digital world in which we want to live. All right. And this is, um, yeah, this is pretty scary. Um, so let's start with what you believe, um, what you call the illusion and the, uh, the AI beast human. What, can you tell us a bit, some, some examples of illustrations? Um, I know I've read about, you know, the dating apps, the uh, automated uh, vehicles. What are the limitations today when it comes to um, some of those AI? I, mean, I know some work, obviously, because people use it, but some are actually pretty limited, and you have a strong opinion on this. What Can you share with us uh, some examples? Yeah. Uh, so first, the general principle. Uh, today, what we mean when we talk about AI are deep artificial neural networks. There are different kinds of AI. But let's talk about these. And these are statistic machines. No statistical tool is the best tool for every problem. And we need to repeat that. So the vision that there soon will be a super intelligence that can do everything that we humans can do and think like humans, just much more better, is a fiction. So we need to ask a different question. What are the domains where AI is promising and where not? And uh, the first way to make a distinction is to uh, separate what I call stable worlds from uncertain, unstable worlds. A stable world is one where uh, the future is similar to the past and the rules are set. So the big successes of AI were in these situations. So this includes chess, okay? It includes uh, Go, Jeopardy, and now uh, large language models who have as a basis a highly stable network of words and correlations from which they can make predictions. If it Go in the other extreme, uncertainty is usually produced by us humans. And when we try to predict human behavior, AI doesn't do as well. That means here, deep neural networks. And the, the failures have been well known when uh, IBM's Watson, after winning at pay Jeopardy, which was a great achievement, then turned to cancer, to Watson Oncology, and by now it has been dismantled and sold in pieces. That's not where it was successful. Or more recently, when we predict human behavior, like the future of fragile families, a Prince project, uh, then that doesn't work very well. Not very well means it's not better then a simple heuristic, like uh, that just deals with two or three variables in predicting behavior. And 
in general, the more uncertain something is, the more simpler we need to make the algorithms. That runs counter to the idea that big data is always a good thing. So that's our first principle. We need to ask the question, where will be an AI application be successful and where that's not the case? The dream that AI would solve all our problems is a religious one. It's a, a technological faith. And it's no surprise that it comes from California. And the uh, it reminds me on the hippie culture, which in a similar way uh, dreamed about uh, yeah, uh, a, a solution that could solve all our problems. No, we need to think along. And we need to open our eyes and use AI where it's useful, but don't buy every business promise. That's very interesting. Thank you. I'm sure our audience will be <laughs> enlightened. Um, the uh, the other the other the other um, thing I, I I remember about you know in your book, which I found really interesting, is this concept of uh, the Texas sharpshooter. You talk about being cautious against um, fake um, relations. So sometimes you feel like you're having really good relations, but actually it doesn't mean anything. And so you call it the um, Texas sharpshooter. Can you tell us a bit more about why it's called like this and what does it mean? Yeah. So uh, that's a story about a sharpshooter who shoots at a bar. And at the end, he shows you an uh, amazing performance. So the target circuit, so the holes are in, in the middle of the structure. The only problem is that the Texas sharpshooter shot first and then painted the circuits around the middle of his balls. That's called, in statistics, that's called data fitting. So that means you fit your models. And the more free parameters you have, the better you can fit. If you shoot at a barn, you just need two parameters. Yeah. So you locate the target into a place that fits in the height and it width, and you can easily do it. So uh, machine learning uh, tries to protect itself by doing out-of-sample prediction. So that's a, a way to go over that. But there are quite many uh, studies still published in the social sciences, for instance, including economics, that basically just fit their models to data and then call this fit a prediction. There's nothing predicted. Data was first, and then the model was fit. That's the Texas shock shooter fallacy. For instance, one study claimed that they can predict whether couples will be still a couple or be divorced in five years and can predict this with 90% perfection. The problem was there was no prediction. It was all data fitting. They knew already which couple had divorced. So that's a kind of statistical literacy. Always ask, what was first? Your theory or your data. Thank you. Um, just before closing the chapter on the limitations, I want to summarize for your audience about the three different areas that we just um, talked about. The first one is how you explain that AI doesn't solve every problem in the world, and that's a good thing. It doesn't help you find love in a normal way, uh, and it has limitations. The second uh, finding and it's like, uh, that we talked about is about the false correlation. We just talked about the Texas sharpshooter and how like you can make relations that don't mean anything. And so you have to be really careful when doing that. And then the third part, which we talked a little bit as well, is the stable world principle and the uh, issue with uncertainty and the fact that AI can only function in a stable world. So now we're going to talk about the risk 
um, you consider that the predictive power of AI is limited by the uncertainty of humans, right? So it presents different risks. And one of the risks that um, you highlight is the problem with the lack of transparency. Today, AI is quite of a black box. Uh, we can't always share, you know, when you have clients, you can always share uh, what is in the black box because then, then that's your secret recipe. But that can be dangerous, right? Because if you can not share, if you're not sharing, then it's not transparent. And then you get um, even the people that are actually making that AI, creating it, don't always know exactly all that comes in. So um, how does that, I mean, I'm sure it's dangerous, but what's your opinion of this absence of transparency? Yeah, uh, I believe that for sensitive algorithms, transparency should be mandatory. So sensitive algorithms are, for instance, credit scoring or up to, yeah, uh, or uh, algorithms that are used in court in order to decide whether you get bail or not. And these algorithms should be transparent. Now, there's a problem that many of the credit scorers I've worked with, they don't understand the algorithms in the first place. They're too complicated. We have shown that credit scoring is one of the domains with high uncertainty. That the prediction whether a person will pay uh, uh, at the right time uh, can be as well be done by very simple algorithms that we call heuristics that just look at two or three variables. And then that can be made transparent. I'm working at the moment with large credit scorers to convince them that they can turn transparent. And there's no reason why they wouldn't. And we need to have a larger value in our society that people understand how important decisions about them are being made. And they also then can decide to accommodate, for instance, most uh uh, credit scorers give you bad uh, scores if you have more than two credit cards. Everyone should know that. And that's easy. And uh, so it's a societal pro problem that citizens should have a right about transparency. And there are many more algorithms that can be made transparent as it's being claimed. And also, in society, in, in predictions, for instance, uh, remember Google flu trends. That is Google engineers' idea about how to predict the spread of the flu. That was an intransparent algorithm. We only know that the original algorithm had about 45 variables. And we don't know the algorithm. And again, the flu is a virus that behaves highly unpredicted. And in this situation, it's not at all clear whether complicated and therefore also intransparent algorithms do any better than very simple one. And actually, my colleagues and I at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin have tested the most simple algorithm, which is, that's what humans do. If there's uncertainty, you don't consider all the past, but only the last, the most recent uh, data point. And actually, we've shown that over the entire time of the predictions of Google flu trends, the recency algorithm, which is the recency heuristic, predicts better every year. And for all the revisions of the uh, uh, Google flu trends algorithm, this is a case where one data point beats big data. And we need to think about these possibilities. It can be different. It's, if it's a stable world, it will be different. But we shouldn't assume that always more is better. That's not the case. Right. The simpler can be better. That's why you talk about fast and frugal um, heuristics. Um, another, <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Eric shows all the books. <laughs> 
the interesting thing is that many people are unhappy mm -hmm. if a simple mm -hmm. algorithm beats a complex one. And it makes them unhappy instead of being happier, that it's more efficient. It costs less. And why this complexity illusion? Yeah, exactly. Um, we um, So as we were talking about the risk, another big risk, and I know you shared that uh, with me in terms of uh, is, uh, the problem of surveillance. Um, surveillance when it comes to um, some governments, um, the risk of uh, the risk that it uh, brings. Um, it's not just the governments and the organizations. I mean, it's them, but it's also every one of us and how we behave, right? So you're, explain, you're explaining that um, the fact that we're hooked on algorithms, that we're hooked with this different social media and all that, uh, we actually participate in this um, in this surveillance mode, right? We give our data, sometimes implicitly, so not, sometimes not, but we kind of like uh, play a role in that behavior. So do you want to tell us what you think in terms of uh, what's happening around the surveillance? Let me start with an analogy to explain uh, the situation you are in if you are on TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook, or some other social media platform. Um, think about the following situation. In the city you live, there is a coffee house which offers free coffee. Now, everyone goes there because it's free. Wonderful. As a consequence, all the other coffee houses get bankrupt. So you have no choice anymore. But still, it's free. It stays free. And you chat with your friends, but in the tables... There are bugs, and on the uh, walls there are video cameras that record every word you say and to whom, and send it to analyze it and send it to third parties. And the coffee house is full with sales people who constantly interrupt you to offer personalized products. That's about the situation you are in when you're on Facebook, Instagram, or other social platforms. You are not the customer in this coffee house. You are the product. Your attention is the main product. The customers are the salespeople who work for the advertising companies and who pay for your coffee. So that's about the situation of surveillance. And uh, many people think, oh, yeah, this is just Meta who has the data. And Meta is a good company, and it's not a government. That's a big illusion. The American law, which we know, at least since Snowden, uh, can have access to all the data that the tech companies have. That's not only the case in China. It's also in the U.S., the big difference is rather than in China, surveillance is open. In the West, it's covered. We have to we had to find out the uh, the way Facebook gets on our data, not because Facebook told us that, because it was revealed, and so on. Uh, the analogy with the coffee house also tells us what the solutions would be. The solutions would be. We want the right to pay for our own coffee so that we are the customers and not the sales force. Now, the question is, how much would that cost us? I've made a, a, a simple calculation. If we want to reimburse Zuckerberg, that is the meta uh, uh, concern for its entire revenue, not just the profit, the entire revenue, then how much would every a person uh, or every user have to pay per month? The answer is about $2. That's a coffee. And we would have our freedom and privacy. That could be done. But we would need politicians who see through the game and don't fall prey to the lobbyists. And we also need 
uses ordinary people who see through and don't are happy to sit in this coffee house and not pay for the coffee. The studies I have done in uh, Germany, which is a country which has a history about surveillance, think about the Stasi or earlier in Germany, who that the governments would love the technology to surveil and manipulate people. So in Germany, we thought people would have opened my eyes and be willing to pay if it would be possible. So we asked uh, uh, representatives, a uh, group of German, over 3,000, uh, how much would we how much would you willing uh, to pay per month so that all the social medias 